If you'd have told me one month ago that on Good Friday, I would be preaching inside of an empty sanctuary, I would have told you that you were crazy. But here we are once again for the fifth time since the middle of March. Each week we've been doing and trying new things in order to make church happen. The learning curve has been incredibly steep. We're trying our absolute best. And for this week, for Good Friday, we decided to do something much easier and simpler where we only need two people to record the sermon. So there's only two people in the sanctuary, myself along with my daughter, Faith, who is helping make the slides happen. Doing the sermon in this way, instead of having the slides typically get embedded into the, into the video, just makes it a lot easier for us. And I think having the slides on the TV are gonna work out really well. So we'll see how it goes. So here we are on Good Friday of Holy Week. Now, before we open up the scriptures and we look at these events that happened 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, before we open up the scriptures, I want to do just a few quick announcements. First of all, I want to say hi to everybody who's been part of our church family for years. I cannot wait to see you again, and I know you can't wait to see one another. Let's keep praying that that would happen much sooner rather than later. But if you're brand new to our church, maybe this is the first time you ever heard me preach, I'm glad you're here as well. There are a lot of new people checking our church out right now, and we would love to know if that's you and who you are. So if you could even press the pause on the video right now and send an email to Rebecca, our awesome admin, just to tell us who you are. We would love to follow up and connect with you. And we'd love to invite you to come check out our church on a Sunday morning once our doors open back up. The next announcement has to do with Easter Sunday. With the coronavirus outbreak that is truly wreaking havoc around the globe, we need to remember maybe more than ever that the tomb is still empty, that Jesus still conquered the grave. While we may not be able to celebrate Easter together inside our building on Sunday morning, we can celebrate it joining billions of Christians around the globe as we celebrate it. I'm going to be preaching a sermon on Easter Sunday called The God of Hope, where I pray that you are filled to overflowing with hope. The sermon is going to be available bright and early on Easter Sunday, so you can have a sunrise service right in your own home. And I want to invite you as well to extend an invitation to your friends and family and neighbors and co-workers who maybe would not have joined you inside our church building on Easter Sunday, but they might click on and watch the sermon online, and you never know what fruit that might bear. So post about it on social media, make some phone calls, email your friends, and invite them to engage in the Easter service alongside with you. And maybe even have them check out this sermon as well. One more announcement, if you haven't done so yet, please click on the button on our homepage to download the program. We have a blank page here where you can take notes during the sermon. There are questions that I wrote particularly for this message to have you dig deeper and have the sermon stick. And then the back side of the program are prayers to pray for our world, for yourself, and for our church. So let's dive in. When it comes to Good Friday, if you had to associate one word with Good Friday, one word that would be a great candidate to use would be the word darkness. And that is a same word you could use to associate with the coronavirus outbreak, the word darkness. But in saying that, it has also been said that it is always the darkest right before the dawn. So just like God brought the greatest good out of the cross, may he do it again. May he do it again in our day. Now, even though news of the coronavirus has filled our minds as of late over the past month, I pray today on Good Friday that we fill our minds with Jesus and the cross and in doing so that we remember what really matters. Today's sermon 
is called the year everything changed. Now, there have been moments in our country where people have said that was a moment when everything changed. And talking to both my mom and dad years past prior to their passings, I remember talking to them about one moment where everything changed for them. It was the moment when JFK got assassinated at 12.30 p.m. on the 22nd of, um, in 1963, in November, November 22nd, 63. For generations of Americans, they remember where they were when that happened. Now, I was born 10 years after that moment, so I only learned about that moment from the history books. But a moment that I experienced myself, a moment when everything changed, was 9-11. I remembered where I was. When I saw the first Twin Tower on fire, there was some news reports of a plane flying into it. We thought at first maybe it was an accident. We weren't sure what was going on. Little did we know what was really happening and how that moment was going to impact our lives as Americans. Well, I've told my daughters that right now, I believe we are in one of those moments. It's not just a moment in time, but it's a moment that has lasted almost a month since mid-March, at least for us in America. It's a moment that continues and will continue for at least another month or so. I believe that in the future, for decades in the future, we're going to look back on this year as an extended moment, the year 2020, and we're gonna say, that was the year that everything changed. Now in saying that, I pray that as we remember this year, we won't only remember all the bad that's going on. And there's a ton of it. There's people dying. There's so many people being sick. The economy's just upside down. Things are shut down right now. But in saying that, I truly hope that when we look back on this year, and we think of it as the year that everything changed, what we'll really mean by that is all the good that came out of this year. That we'll remember how God brought out in this unfolding story, we don't know what the next chapter brings, but we have hope and faith that God is gonna bring the greatest good out of this bad. So that when we look back at this year, we'll remember the good. For example, how, how people pressed the reset button in their lives. They started to reevaluate what really mattered and they chose to live very differently and much more intentionally, focusing a lot less on their stuff, focusing not so much about how, how busy they are and choosing being busy as almost a badge of honor, but they chose to slow down and to focus on what really matters, which is people and ultimately God. I pray that this pandemic lights a fire in Christians around the globe. And I'm preaching to myself as I'm preaching to you, that God would just light us on fire when it comes to our faith, and that God would bring revival, not only in our state, in our country, but across the world. That's why I hope we look back at this year as the year that everything changed. But my sermon today isn't about the coronavirus. It's not about the year 2020. When I'm talking about the year that everything changed, the reason why I titled my, my uh, sermon that way was to actually go back 2,000 years to 33 AD, to 33 AD, which was the year that Jesus was crucified and died. And how everything changed as a result, truly, everything change and how we relate to God. That's what I'm going to be preaching on today. Now, as I prayed about what aspects of the Good Friday story to focus on, I really felt like the Holy Spirit led me in an interesting way, where instead of focusing on our sin, I want to have our primary focus be on the majesty of God. I'm excited to preach today to point out details in the Good Friday narrative that you normally don't hear preached in sermons by pastors on Good Friday. I hope as a result that you will be more in awe of Jesus, more thankful for his sacrifice on the cross as payment 
for your sin. And so we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew today, chapter 27. And we're actually going to pick up the story when Jesus had already been hanging on the cross for three hours. Here's what the verse says in Matthew 27, verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Jesus had been slowly dying on the cross since 9 a.m. So now it's noon. And for the next three hours, something changes. The text says that from noon until three, an eclipse happens. That darkness came over all the land. I remember growing up in the Catholic Church. Those three hours were an especially time that was sacred. I remember being encouraged not to do anything from 12 to 3 on Good Friday, but to spend that time reflecting on Jesus and the cross. There's a memory I have, a random memory of me when I was probably about 10 years old at my mom and dad's house in Clinton Township, where I was in our garage, and I remember just being seated, leaning up against our door to go into our house, and just being still and thinking about Jesus, thinking about him dying on the cross, thinking about the eclipse, thinking about the darkness over the land. The next verse says, About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew does not have any detail of what happened from noon until three, so he skips ahead now three hours, where Jesus cries out, and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, as a Christian in America, it's very easy to miss the depth of those words when Jesus was hanging on the cross. But we need to realize that for the first time in all of eternity, the relationship between God the Son and God the Father was broken. It was severed. And the reason that this occurred was because Jesus took all of our sins every person that ever lived, past, present, and future, into his body. And just like our sin creates a separation between us and God, our sin separated Jesus from the Father. Here's what the Apostle Peter wrote. He said, Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. For by his wounds you are healed. Again, it starts off by saying Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross. As a result of that, Jesus was experiencing an emotional pain, a pain of feeling separated from his father. And there's actually a clue right in the text, going back to the 46th verse. It says about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Those words contain a clue about what is going on in that moment relationally between Jesus the Son, God the Son, and the Father. Here's a did you know. This is the only time in the life of Jesus that he refers to the first person of the Trinity as God and not as Father. This, again, gives us a clue to what Jesus meant by those words. Again, he wasn't just quoting the 22nd Psalm. He was experiencing a reality that he had never experienced in all of eternity, where he felt separated. He felt abandoned by his Father. So he referred to him simply as God and not his Father. I submit to you that that pain, that feeling of that emotional separation was infinitely more painful than the spikes that were driven through his hands and his feet. That is what Jesus chose to do. That is what Jesus chose to experience for you and for me to have our sins washed away. And may we never forget that. The next verse says, When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. This is the moment everything changed. 
Yes, America changed with the assassination of JFK. Yes, America changed as well on 9-11. And right now, in the year 2020, America is presently changing. And as huge as each of those events are, I submit to you that they pale in comparison with this moment. In the year 33 AD, just after 3 p.m. at Calvary, when Jesus breathed his last breath, because that was the moment, the moment of his death, when everything changed when it came to how we can relate to God. Let me dig into that a little bit more. Again, it says, When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Again, I said, that's the moment everything changed. And the reason I can say that is what's in the very next verse. It says, at that moment, again, at the moment that he breathed his last breath, at the moment he gave up his spirit, at the moment he died, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, as a Christian in America, you might read that and say, well, so what? What's the big deal about a curtain being torn in two? Curtains tear all the time, right? Especially if you buy them at the dollar store. What's the big deal about this curtain being torn in two? Well, that actually is a symbol of how everything changed in how we relate to God. Let me explain. See, back in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, the presence of God resided in the temple in Jerusalem. And, and, and the presence of God was not just in the temple itself, but it was in the innermost part of it, which was known as the most holy place, also known as the Holy of Holies. Now, that was the way God chose to do things back in the Old Covenant era. He chose to have his presence in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. And because God is God, he can do things however he wants to, right? And so that's the way he chose to do things back in that covenant. So if you were a believer in God back then, and you wanted to get closer to the presence of God, you would have to travel to get to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, once you got to the temple, in order to enter, to enter what are known as the outer courts of the temple, which would get you even closer to the presence of God, there were a series of things you had to do in order to purify yourself. In other words, there were certain things that you could not do a few days prior to going to the temple. There were some things you needed to avoid. There were some things that you had to stay away from in order to keep yourself from being unclean or impure. Now, if you're able to meet all of those criteria and that you could enter the outer courts of the temple, then you needed to offer animal sacrifices for various things. So there were a number of animals that were being slaughtered. People have said that, that the faith of the Jewish people was a very bloody religion, and they were right. So again, those were the things that everyday believers in God were required to do. But even then, even then, they could not enter the actual presence of God in what was known again as the most holy place or the holy of holies. They could get closer to the presence of God by doing those things, but they couldn't be in the actual presence of God. Only one person could do that. And that person was the high priest and he could only do it once a year on the Day of Atonement. Let me take you back to the Old Testament era to Leviticus, the third book of the Bible. Chap in in the, the Day of Atonement, the 16th chapter. I want to read a few, a few passages, a few verses from that passage that describe what the high priest needed to do in order to get closer to God, in order to enter the actual presence of God. And as I read these verses, I would invite you to enter into the story, to imagine being the high priest, and imagine, imagine having to go through all these things to enter into the actual presence of God. Here we go in Leviticus chapter 16, starting in verse 2. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron, that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain, 
But this is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred tunic, a linen tunic, with undergarments of linen next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And there are actually a dozen verses after that of all the things the high priest has to do in order to enter into the presence of God. So God's presence was made available to only the high priest one day a year on the Day of Atonement. And in order for the priest to enter into the presence of God, he had to jump through a number of hoops. And he had to do everything the right way. Now there's a detail that we might have missed. In order to enter into the presence of God, he had to walk through a curtain. Again, here is one of the verses I just read. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain. There was a thick curtain that created a separation from the rest of the temple to, again, what's known as the most holy place or the holy of holies. Tradition in the Jewish faith states that this temple curtain was very thick, as thick as a man's hand. Historians say it was four inches thick. They claim that if there were two horses that had the curtain attached to them and they went opposite directions, two horses could not tear this curtain in half. So again, this was a thick curtain. And it acted like a barrier. This curtain acted like a barrier between God and everyone else. It was a tangible barrier. So with that in mind, let's go back to the moment everything changed in the year everything changed in 33 AD, the moment when Jesus died on the cross. The passage says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. At that moment, everything changed with how it was possible to relate to God. The text says that this curtain was torn in two, which implies a divine action, that this was an act of God. It did not tear by accident. The tearing of this curtain meant that the barrier between us and God was removed. The old way of doing things was gone, and a new way, a new covenant had begun. The tearing of the curtain meant, in very practical terms, hey, high priest, you've got to get a new job because you're unemployed now. You're no longer needed. In this era, God related to his people in a whole new way where everybody, not just the high priest, had unrestricted access to the very presence of God. And we didn't have access to this presence of God just one day a year, but we had 24-7 access, 365 days a year. The moment the curtain was torn in two, a new way to relate to God was made available to anybody who chose to follow him. Here are a few verses in the New Testament book of Hebrews that describe this new way that we could relate to God. Hebrews 10. So, friends, we can now, without hesitation, walk right up to God into the holy place. Hebrews 4 says, Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may get mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There's a helpful explanation of what the author of Hebrews is talking about from a Bible commentary. I love the word Bible commentary. It says this, The throne of grace is the place of God's presence. The only one who was permitted to draw near to God in the Old Testament era was the high priest, who could approach God's presence once a year on the Day of Atonement. The writer of the book of Hebrews encourages Christians to recognize that Jesus Christ has achieved for them what the nation of Israel never enjoyed, namely 
immediate access to God and the freedom to draw near to him continually. In the New Testament era, there's no curtain that creates a separation between us and God. And God is no longer confined to a temple in Jerusalem. And we don't need to go through the high priest to get to God. In the New Testament era, everything changed. We have 24 access to God through things like prayer. And while that truly is inspiring and it is amazing, there is a caution that I want to give to our church. And again, this is a moment that I'm preaching to you as I'm preaching to myself. The caution is how we treat God in that process. As I shared earlier, I was born and raised in the Catholic Church. And as I think about what I thought about God back as a Catholic kid, I pictured God as being pretty unapproachable, as being quite impersonal, being pretty distant. I kind of thought of him like he was behind a curtain if you will. Now again, I'm not saying that was what the church taught. That's just kind of how I processed things. That's how I personally pictured God growing up. Well, then I took a five-year sabbatical from God and from the church about the time that I, that I graduated from high school. I like to say I graduated from my belief in God. And there's a long story I don't have time to share today. But after five years, I gave God and I gave church a second chance. And when I began going to church again in my mid-20s, I feel like I swung the pendulum kind of in the opposite direction, which I'll explain a little bit more in just a moment. Again, more information I don't have time to share, but a few years after I found myself going back to church, I actually found myself going to seminary to study to be a pastor. And while I was out in California going to seminary, that was the first time I ever saw someone who had on a t-shirt that said this. The t-shirt said, Jesus is my homeboy. A couple years after that, I came across someone who had a toy. It was an action figure of Jesus, and it was called Buddy Jesus. And it was two thumbs up like Fonzie from Happy Days. That was Buddy Jesus. And I never owned that t-shirt, didn't own that action figure. And even if those offend you, let me challenge you and say, I think that both of those are a picture of how oftentimes Christians, including myself, can view our creator and our sustainer. Sure, we wouldn't go so far as to have a Jesus buddy action figure called Jesus our homeboy. It wouldn't go that far. But in essence, that's kind of a flippant way to say that's how we can relate to God without even realizing it, that we maybe are too comfortable with how we relate to God in the New Testament era. Let me contrast what I just shared with what the Apostle John encountered when he encountered Jesus in the Revelation, in a vision he had at the end of time. We pick it up in chapter 1 in the 17th verse, where John says, When I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. You see, in those verses, Jesus was a far cry from John's homeboy. He was not John's buddy. John realized that he was in the presence of his creator, of the great God, of the almighty God. So with that reality in mind, of just who Jesus is, a reminder of who God is. Verses like this one should really blow our minds. Again, going back to Hebrews 10. So friends, we can now, without any hesitation, walk right up to God into the holy place. I mean, that is an amazing truth. 
that the Almighty God, the Creator God, that God is personal. He wants to be in relationship with us. He calls us friend. And he invites us to walk right up to him without hesitation, to do so with confidence. See, because of the cross, because Jesus took our sin upon himself, and because of his death, the curtain was torn in two. A new covenant was established where a new relationship was made possible with God. But that new relationship, may we not treat casually. In the New Testament era, there's no curtain that creates a separation between us and God. God's not confined to a temple in Jerusalem, and we don't need to go through a high priest to get to God. In the New Testament era, everything has changed. In this Good Friday sermon, I decided again, I didn't want to focus so much on our sin, but I wanted to focus primarily on the majesty of God. I pray that as a result of my sermon, you'll think about God in a different way. But as I prayed about it, I didn't want you just to walk away with thinking about God in a different way. I wanted you to interact with God in a different way, to do something in a different way. And as I thought about having 24-7 access to God, the primary way we have access to God is through prayer. So I wanted to make this sermon very, very practical by ending it by talking about how to pray, maybe in a different way than you have in a long time. You see, it's so easy when we pray to rush into God's presence and not really think about who we're praying to. King Solomon wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Solomon said, Don't be too quick to speak. Don't be in a hurry to say anything to God. God is in heaven, you are on earth. So use only a few words when you speak. With that in mind, here's a quote from the book Crazy Love by Francis Chan, where Francis Chan writes, What if I said, stop praying? What if I told you to stop talking at God for a while and instead take a long, hard look at him before you speak another word? Solomon warned us not to rush into God's presence with words. That's what fools do, and that's what we often do. So may we approach the throne room with confidence. May we do it often, but may we remember who we're praying to. I have a bunch of action steps to give you, but this is the primary one that I want to share today. It's before you pray, read Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Read that chapter first before you pray. I encourage you to do this tonight. Do it tomorrow on Holy Saturday. Maybe begin your Easter Sunday by doing this action step. And even beyond Easter Sunday. But every time you pray. Before you pray, don't rush into God's presence. Instead, open your Bible and read this passage. Read it first and then pray. Let me read you a portion of it. It's titled The Throne of Heaven, and it's a chapter about the majesty of God. Let me start in the first verse, chapter 4 in Revelation. John says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone seated on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Verse 6 says, In the center around the throne were four creatures, four living creatures. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Skipping down to the ninth verse. 
whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by you they were created and have their being. So again, your action step is to read that entire chapter, chapter 4 of Revelation, verses 1 through 11, before you pray. Don't rush into God's presence. I mean, may we walk boldly into it and do so with confidence, but may we not rush into the presence of God when we pray. But instead, open up that passage. Spend some time thinking about what you read. Enter into that story. What's described? The throne of heaven. How God is pictured. The majesty of our great God. Realize who you're praying to, remember who you're praying to, and then and only then begin to pray. If you do that, I'll bet you'll pray very differently as a result. Now, I want to give a few more action steps in how to spend the rest of your day today in how to live in a different way on Good Friday because today is not like any other Friday of the year. It's Good Friday. So as I wrap up, I have some super practical action steps to share. But before I do, let me press the pause button just a moment on my sermon and to say this. I know that we are in unprecedented times. There's so much uncertainty right now. And so because of that, let me say thank you when you give to the mission. You know, for the past nine years, we have said this again and again. We have said Every dollar given is a gift that we do not take for granted. That has been true for the past nine years, and it feels even more true right now. So we have a slide on ways to give. And I want to say thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity. You are truly helping make our church happen. And my prayer is that when you give, what you give will not only sustain us through this storm that we're in, it will not only sustain us, but when we're able to open our doors back up and use this building seven days a week, that we will be in a strong financial position so that we will be able to do all the things that God has laid on our hearts. I am praying for a great harvest. I am praying for revival. I am praying that God uses the mission to transform not only Shelby Township, but our entire region. And so I want to say thank you for helping make that a reality when you give. We want to invite people who are part of our church family who've been with us for years. Thank you for giving as well as those who maybe are brand new to the church. Thank you for your ties and your offerings. I would love to encourage you to either mail in a check to the address you see on your screen, or you can give online right at our homepage. Click on the Give button, and there's a safe and secure and easy way to give. You can give a one-time gift or set up a frequency at your choosing. However you choose to do, whatever you choose to do, however the Holy Spirit leads you, thank you, thank you for giving. So again, as I wrap up, I have a few final, very practical action steps on how to spend the rest of this day. I don't know when you're watching this sermon. It was available first thing on Good Friday morning and available all day long. So however much more time you have left in your Good Friday, here are some action steps that you may want to do the rest of the time, as well as on Holy Saturday, which again, if you remember... Jesus was still in the tomb 2,000 years ago, and his followers didn't have the rest of the story. So these action steps, I'm going to give a bunch of them. Pray about each one and do the ones you feel the Holy Spirit leading you to do. First thing you may want to consider doing on Good Friday, as well as on Holy Saturday, is to turn off the TV. Don't be distracted by the news. Take a Sabbath rest from watching the news. Turn off your smartphone. Get off the internet and focus on God. 
If you do turn on the TV, please only do so if you watch a movie about Jesus, like The Passion of the Christ, or the movie The Son of God, or another film. So that's something you may want to consider doing. Another option is to sign up for our 24-7 prayer week. The prayer week is going on actually right now. It wraps up on Easter morning, and so there's still time to sign up in a two-hour slot. We're praying around the clock, and there's opportunities. We'd love every adult, woman, and child, every man, every grandparent to sign up, every team. And you can do so right on our homepage. And multiple people can sign up for each slot. And please know that when you click on the button on our homepage, there are prayer pages, ways to pray, and ways to help you understand how to spend that two hours. Trust me, it will fly by. So please consider doing that. Another option of something to do on Good Friday is to read what's known as a harmony of the Gospels of the final 24 hours of Jesus' life before he went to the cross through the time he was buried in the tomb. I actually wrote a blog about this where I took the four Gospels and I created a harmony of the accounts where you can read those passages in the order they happen. It'll get you through all four Gospels. And it might take you an hour or two to read them. And if it does, great. Maybe you read a little bit on Good Friday, the rest on Holy Saturday. Let me encourage you, read it slowly. Reflect as you read. Pray as you read. Ask God to give you fresh eyes to read some texts that sometimes can be very, very common and familiar to you. Ask God to give you fresh eyes to see what you're reading. Something else you may want to do on Good Friday is to examine your conscience, to spend some time being still before the Lord and asking God to remind you by his Holy Spirit what thoughts, words, and actions fall short of the glory of God. Reflect on the truth of the classic song that says that it wasn't ultimately the nails that held Jesus on the cross. It was our sins. It was our sins that held him there until it was accomplished. So perhaps spend time reflecting and confessing your sins to God. Something else you may want to do is take communion. We offer communion every Sunday during our church service and during the home edition of the mission, we've encouraged folks to take communion in their homes. So through the online church experience that's available on our homepage, there's a link to a blog that I wrote that explains how to take communion at home using elements that you already have in your home. We take communion every week at the, at the mission, especially on Good Friday. Please spend some time taking communion, remembering in a tangible way the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Something else you may want to do on Good Friday is enter into worship. Part of our online church experience, and I'm excited especially for the first time since we've been under the stay home, stay safe mandate. We're not just showing some videos on YouTube from churches uh, and bands across the country, but Beth Carter, our, our own director of worship, has a worship set that she's leading us through, and it's an incredible set. And so I want to invite you, if you haven't watched it already, enter into it, and don't just watch it, worship with us as Beth leads us. There's a link, here's a picture of the website. It's a bit washed out, a bit hard to see, but I wanna point out briefly, anywhere here, this whole banner, you click anywhere on there, that's access to the online church experience. My blog is down here and the opportunity to sign up for, for the 24 seven prayer week is here. And then the button to give is right there up front. So I just wanna point that out to you, some ways to connect. One more thing, actually two more things to do on Good Friday for you to consider is to go through the Digging Deeper questions. Again, I wrote these specifically for the sermon and these are a way to make the sermon stick to help you process what you just heard. So you can print these off, you can go through as many questions as you feel led to, but that going through those questions would be a great way to get the most out of your Good Friday experience. And your final action step. This is the key action step I already shared. It's before you pray, read Revelation chapter four, verses one through 11. 
I pray that you do that. You spend some time entering into that text. And then pray. And if you do that, I believe you will pray a whole different way. Because you'll remember the majesty of God. So once again, thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for being part of the home edition of the mission. And we'll see you back again on Easter Sunday.